just a little bit about uh, emerald ash borer to begin with. It was, uh, it's an exotic beetle, was discovered in 2002 uh, in uh, an area just outside of Detroit, Michigan. And since that time, it has spread to 35 states and five Canadian provinces. So it's a very aggressive insect. It attacks ash trees. Um, the adult stage of the insect just kind of nibbles on the, the leaves, but it's the larval stage of the insect which is most destructive and uh, uh, basically eats the, the tissue right underneath the bark and cuts off the uh, movement of nutrients through the tree and uh, uh, kills it over a number of years. Doesn't kill it the first year it attacks. Unlike some other insects, it's, uh, it actually takes uh, quite a few years for it to, to kill a tree. Um, since that time, it's killed hundreds of millions of ash trees across the eastern part of our country. It's spread as far west as uh, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, uh, to the south. And uh, also, there's an infestation that's been found in Colorado. So it made the jump across the plains to the, to the Rocky Mountains. Um, to give you some more background about this insect, um, my name is, is Greg Jostin. I'm the state forester with the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. And I'm going to be moderating our uh, panel discussion this afternoon, which means I'm going to introduce the speakers and let them do their thing. Um, today we have with us uh, Dr. John Ball. Uh, Dr. Ball is a professor of forestry at South Dakota State University and also uh, our state's only extension forester. And uh, the other hat that he wears is he's the forest health specialist for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. And he's been following and studying emerald ash borer basically about since it was found in the country. And, uh, uh, he's uh, well known as being an expert on the insect and we're very happy to have him here in South Dakota to help us with our, uh, our planning and strategizing as to how we're going to deal with this insect. Also today with us is uh, Mr. Tom Gear. Tom is the Assistant Director of uh, uh, Ag Services for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. Um, he's responsible for agronomy, plant industry, and dairy programs, and he's been with the Department of Agriculture for 16 years. Prior to that, worked in the seed and pesticide industry. Also today, we have with us uh, Mr. Kelby Miris. Kelby is the operations manager, manager for the City of Sioux Falls Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, since May of 2018, his work is focused on managing this new emerald ash borer infestation. Uh, within the city of Sioux Falls. Um, Sioux Falls has a dense population of ash, causing, things, causing this to be a, a major project. And Kelby's going to update us on uh, what the city of Sioux Falls has been doing to meet the challenge of this new threat. Uh, it was found here in Sioux Falls uh, a year ago this last May. And, uh, you know, ash is a, a very prevalent tree in South Dakota. It's one of our most common trees that we find in our communities. And it's been planted extensively in windbreaks across the state. And also uh, it's found in our native uh, woodlands. Uh, uh, basically just about any place that trees can grow uh, in, in South Dakota, uh, we can find ash trees. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Ball to start us off. And he's going to talk about the uh, biology of the insect and control methods and good information like that. So. All right. Well, thank you, Greg. And thank you, everybody, for being here this afternoon. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm going to start out with a little bit about the beetle biology in that and uh, a little bit about control measures and what we expect to see in the future here. Uh, that's a picture of the grub form, the worm form in the tree. In fact, that's a picture that was sent to me last year, first weekend in May, by a tree company in Sioux Falls that found the insect by accident. They were merely trimming an ash tree, not that it was dying back, but just merely trimming it away from a building. When they made a cut, it showed the revealed underneath the bark, and they thought, oh my goodness, that looks like what Dr. Ball's been talking about. Let's text him a picture. So Saturday morning, I got that picture and said, Dr. Ball, what do you think? And I emailed or texted back, I think I'll see you in an hour. 
and that kind of started it. Right now, we have the adult stage out. They are flying right now. In fact, we're at peak flight period right now. So we got more of them flying in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota than almost at any other time of the year. But the finding of that insect, the confirmation of that insect, it's actually been here now for uh, four years this year, set off an entire chain of event through our South Dakota Department of Ag and through APHIS at the federal level. And South Dakota joined the inevitable list of states and provinces that now have this insect. The problem with this insect is there's the 10-year survival of green ash. Zero. And you might say, well, I don't have a green ash, I have a patmore ash, or I have a summit ash, or I have a Marshall seedless ash. They're all green ash trees. And a 10-year survival without treatment is 100% loss. In Sioux Falls, they've got about 85,000 ash trees. And about a third of their canopy, as Kelby will talk about, and that means uh, they're going to lose every one of them, and we'll lose every one of them across the entire state. If you say, well, gee, I have a white ash tree, take a look at that 10-year survival, just about 100%. If you say, well, I don't have either of those, I have a black ash, survival is zero, 100% loss. So once the insect is found in your community or in your county, you can start the clock. And within about 10 years, you're going to find that every ash tree has become infested and most of them have died. In South Dakota, we cannot depend on the fact that your ash tree is going to survive. No other state has had it. Over 100 million ash trees have been killed. Don't expect you to have the lucky tree. You are going to lose all your trees, all your ash trees, unless they're treated. So what kills them? You know, is there any hope? Well, first of all, woodpeckers love them. Woodpeckers find them tasty. Uh, they've really developed a taste for Chinese, apparently, because they love this little Chinese insect. And in fact, that's the way we find an infested tree. Uh, they're better at spotting them than we are. And they'll go out there and shred the bark off the top of the trees to search for these little insects. In fact, I took this picture of this last week there. Uh, you can see on the left side of it, that was the little peck. When I pull the bark away, the gallery stops. Every tree I've looked at, every peck I've looked at, they're always spot on. Anywhere they put a peck into that tree, they pulled out an insect. They are that good at finding them. Trouble is, squirrels like to take bark off ash trees too. They're not looking for emerald ash where heaven knows what they're doing. But nevertheless, we tell people, don't just look for bark being flaked off your tree what we call blonding, which woodpeckers will do, but you literally need to find the woodpecker pecks in it as well. Well, what else will kill them? Natural enemies. Uh, through APHIS, a federal program, we've also assisted in bringing in the natural enemies of emerald ash borer from China. These are actually being reared in Michigan right now, and, that, and they were released last year and they're being released this year. The thing is, they're not going to be an excellent control measure. They're just going to help a little bit. As you notice, maybe 20%. Woodpeckers do a far better job of killing them than this. But nevertheless, going out there and releasing these small insects, which we do on a weekly basis during the summer in the northern part of Sioux Falls where the population of uh, boar is the highest, uh, we're helping to, again, do something to help slow the spread of this insect. How about the winter? South Dakota's pride themselves in the fact we have horrible winters, all right? And everybody thought, well, you know, maybe this will kill it. No. Uh, this is found in areas of China that get just as cold as South Dakota. And so we cannot hope that this will kill them. We all know we had a cold winter and we had a hard winter. And when we looked at this winter, you know, you say, my goodness, you can kill almost all of them. It gets to minus 30. That's minus 30 under the bark. And bark is a heck of a good insulator. And so we went out and did our sampling this winter. What we found is the ones that are up in the very tip top, you bet, we killed a lot of them. The ones that were low on the trunk, we killed barely any of them. So what do we end up killing? About 30%. Does that help slow it? Absolutely. So the combination of woodpeckers, the natural enemies we're releasing, and our winter all help to not stop it, but they'll help slow it. They'll buy us more time than some of the more southern communities. Okay, now we have it in Sioux Falls. 
you know, what are we going to do? Well, figure out how long it's been here. We now figure about four years at this year, three years from last. Treat the trees you want to save. All right, the rest, well, remove the trees you don't want, remove the trees that are infested, and if we do nothing, we're going to have them falling in the street. That's our death curve, which is taken from modeling from uh, researchers out east. Notice we're fairly low on that curve right now. And notice if Sioux Falls did nothing, and Sioux Falls is doing a tremendous amount, that what they would find is barely any difference in the next couple of years. Oh, yeah, you notice a dying tree here or there. But 85,000 trees, missing a couple of thousand isn't going to change anything. But then in five years, the population explodes and they'll lose 61,000 trees over three years. And nobody can keep up with that many losses. That's why I appreciate the fact that Sioux Falls stepped right up and are doing active management now. Because the law right now, we're saying we're not seeing a lot of dying trees, so we don't really need to do anything as cost too many cities. We're telling people in Sioux Falls, if you like your ash trees, treat them. You know, like I tell people, now it's arrived. Your ash trees are like your children, pick your favorites. What trees do you want to keep and what trees don't you? And treatments are very effective if they're trunk injections. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is the primary way and the only way you can treat them effectively is hire a commercial applicator. There's nothing you can buy from the hardware store that actually works. So you need to actually hire someone to come out and do this. The cost range is found from about $7 to $12 a diameter inch. Measure the diameter tree at about chest level. If it's 10 inches, it's probably going to cost you about $100. If you have more trees, it costs you a little bit less. If you have one big tree and it's out by itself, it's going to cost you a little bit more than that $10 an inch or even $12 an inch. And you're going to do that every other year for at least five times. And then you're going to do it about every three years forever, for as long as you live in that home. So we have nothing that will cure this. We have no vaccine. We have no immunity. This is an ongoing treatment. But when I looked at the cost of treatments versus the cost of removals, we found that if you have a nice looking ash tree that's about 20 inches in diameter, the cost of removing it now versus the cost of treating it over the next 25 years, that's how long it takes to equal out. So it really makes sense to treat individual homeowner trees that are large diameter and add a lot to their landscape. But if they're small trees, less than 10 inches, there's no reason to keep them. You can cut that tree down in a few minutes and plant something that'll be here for a long time. The other thing is Sioux Falls is an active ash removal program. Every community in South Dakota ought to have an active program to start removing their ash trees. Everywhere in South Dakota will be impacted by this insect within the next 20 years. No community will be spared. So if you get started now, you can do it over a longer time period. Sioux Falls is a program, as Kelby will talk about, to start thinning that herd, getting rid of trees. All right, uh, they're removing them uh, from uh, during the winter. We do not cut the trees during the summer in Sioux Falls because we do have the beetle. We don't want to be moving the beetle around the town at all. And they're doing a great job of starting at the southern part of Sioux Falls where we don't have a real large population of insect, or at least a detectable population of insect. And so what they're doing is trying to hold them in the northern part of the city first. But they're thinning out the trees, as he'll talk about, to reduce the population now so you're not going to suddenly have to remove 61,000 trees over two or three years. The other thing to this is, again, that population builds up, the tree population crashes, and then guess what? Trees start to fall. With emerald ash borer, the hazard of the trees failing is extremely high. This isn't like Dutch elm disease, where a tree can die and stand at that street corner for 10 years. The problem with this insect is the way it kills the trees, the trees out dry out very quickly, they're referred to as styrofoam when they're done. And they fall in unpredictable ways. Communities that have bought into this lull that I don't see any problem, then suddenly lose all their trees over three years, can't keep up with the removals. And they call me because they're saying, John, what do we do? We have trees falling in the street. All right, again, that's one of the things we're going to try to avoid in, in South Dakota. The other bit of advice I'll give you as I end is, oh, let's stop planting maple. And one of the things about Sioux Falls we know is about a third of the trees are maple. All right, the reason we don't want you planting those, and I get a kick out of this, there was a parking lot in Sioux Falls where they cut down the infested ash trees, and they went right back in and planted maples. We don't want maples. Reason why? We have another insect, the Asian longhorn beetle. 
which we have not found in South Dakota yet, but they have found in other areas of the country, and that kills maples, red maple and Freeman maples. So let's dial it back and try to get a diversity of tree populations out there. So where's it going next? In Sioux Falls, you might say, well, what's the point of this to me? We looked at the spread pattern of Dutch elm disease in the state of South Dakota, county by county, and since it's spread by trees, which are carried by firewood, I expect the pattern to be very similar to emerald ash borer. And here's the interesting thing. Dutch elm disease showed up where first in the state of South Dakota? Sioux Falls. All bad things start here. By 1973, that's how far it spread. I expect it to be about the same for this. Uh, within about four years from finding it, we're going to find most of southeastern South Dakota infested. That doesn't mean every tree will be dead. That means we'll find pockets of it throughout that area. Within about 10 years, we'll probably find it most of East River, plus down a little bit on, uh, by winter in that. Again, that, that does not mean every tree infested. That means we'll find it in communities throughout that area. Some will not be impacted yet. By that time, I expect within 10 years, we'll find it out in the hills. Why? Because of the movement of firewood. And I expect the last county to be impacted is going to be Harding County, probably almost 20 years from now. The problem is it's inevitable. So the best we can do, and it's a lot we can do, we can slow the spread by every community more time to go out there and manage the population rather than just dealing with hundreds and hundreds of standing dead trees. So with that, I'll turn it back to Greg here. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Ball. Next, uh, Tom Gear is going to talk with us about uh, the efforts to contain the spread by, uh, through the use of quarantines in the state. So Tom. All right, thanks Greg. Um, you know, Dr. Ball talked a little bit about uh, slowing the spread. You know, forming a quarantine is another way of uh, also slowing the spread of uh, emerald ash borer. Uh, we'll take you back a little bit. Uh, last May, when uh, EAB was discovered in Sioux Falls, we started, uh, you know, the process of going through, uh, you know, forming a quarantine. Um, the Secretary of Ag at, Ag at the time, uh, Secretary Jaspers, he signed an emergency declaration to uh, form a quarantine, you know, basically around the city of Sioux Falls. We got uh, um, USDA APHIS involved, uh, Dr. Ball, Game Fish and Parks. You know, what are we gonna do? Where do, we, where do we draw the line at? As you can see on the map there, this is the current uh, quarantine, the entire uh, city. Uh, most of Mini, er, Minnehaha County, west to uh, Highway 19. Follow the line down on 19 into Lincoln County. Um, you know, typically, you know, you might see a quarantine area where it goes by county. Uh, we decided to go uh, this route. We thought it'd be the simplest way um, in regards to uh, our quarantine. Other states in the United States, um, there's a map of all the states that currently have uh, emerald ash borer and have some type of quarantine. Like Iowa, for example, they designated the whole entire state. And we decided not to do the entire state because we just wanted to keep it in one you know, area of South Dakota the best that we could to slow the spread. Uh, when you open up the quarantine to an entire state, that means you can move uh, product all around within that state. So with that said, you know, said we joint and federal state effort with uh, USDA APHIS. Um, USDA APHIS is kind of the, the lead in this whole thing. Um, we did a state quarantine because going through the, the, having a federal quarantine, they can only do an entire state but then they also uh, submitted the paperwork to mirror our quarantine here in South Dakota. It regulates, the quarantine regulates all the life stages of EAB and it regulates the movement of all uh, ash material within the area. Um, one of the other things that we did too was the emergency declaration was only for so many days. 
can't remember how many days it was right off the top of my head, but it gave us time to promulgate rules. So we went through the rulemaking process and we adopted uh, the rules for us in, within South Dakota. So we do have a little bit of enforcement that we could take if people would move Ashwood outside the quarantine area, for example. Um, the official rules took place December 19th. Um, prior quarantine regulations that we had, you know, it, as you can see on the slide there, it just covered, you know, plant material and uh, plant diseases. The regulated material, I mean, it regulates any life stage of the emerald ash borer. Um, any ash nursery stock, ash logs and lumber, um, hard firewood, ash chips and mulch, and uh, wood packing material. The regulated material articles, you know, they can move freely within the quarantine area like I stated before. Um, if, say for example, if you own a company and you wanna move some uh, ashwood material outside the quarantine area, you need to contact the Department of Ag, then we, what we do is we'll come and inspect the material that you want to move and give you, and we'll sign a compliance agreement giving you permission to move outside the quarantine area. First of all, you'd have to treat, treat it. There's several different treatment options that you could do to the ash wood or the hardwood that you want to move outside the quarantine area. You can fumigate it, um, you could chip it, it's got to be a certain size chips. Um, you can debark the, the logs. Plus, you got to take a half inch of the um, additional half inch of the wood. You can't have any residual bark on the, that wood, or you can heat treat it. The purpose of the quarantine, like I stated, you know, was to prolong the spread. Um, like Dr. Ball said, it could take years for it to move across the state of South Dakota. Possible federal deregulation. Currently, we work with USDA APHIS on trapping. Um, if it get, does get deregulated, there's been talk basically since, you know, last year and a half or so of, uh, you know, the feds doing away with the EAB program. They still will continue to... Uh, you know, do the, the bio side as far as release and loss, that type of stuff. Um, we'd still continue to trap here in South Dakota. And of course, we'd still have our uh, quarantine regulations in place. Another item that we've been working on, uh, we work closely with game fish and parks. Um, naturally, you know, they have a lot of park systems in South Dakota, a lot of ash trees in those parks. Um, and they've been, you know, having a don't move firewood pledge for, you know, several years. Uh, we worked with them this past May with their support. Um, we had some Facebook posts in regards to it, and people could go online and take the pledge that they're not going to move uh, firewood. I know when you go online now to uh, reserve a camping spot or whatever with uh, game fish and parks, they have language in there that you can't bring in your own firewood or you're not supposed to, if they do discover it, they ask you to leave it there at the, the front gate where you check in. Um, you know, one of the things you, you need to do is, you know, use local firewood. You know, like I know if you camp, there's a lot of places, or the game fishing parks so will have firewood that you can buy there. You know, make sure you burn it all before you leave. Don't take it with you. Um, Look on, the, if you do buy firewood, I know you go like these different gas stations, you might see stacks of uh, firewood along the walls of the gas station or whatever. Make sure that it's labeled, make sure it's treated properly. Um, and you know, verify that it's certified. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Kelby, or I guess back to Greg. Okay, thanks Tom. Yeah, uh, Kelby is up next. He's going to talk about what the city of Sioux Falls is doing uh, regarding their emerald ash borer infestation. Kelby. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Kelby Maris. I'm the park operations manager for the city of Sioux Falls. And we've put together an emerald ash borer response plan. Of course, we were planning for the infestation long before it got here. 
uh, doing some preemptive removals, uh, especially within the park system. We hadn't planted an ash tree in several years in any of the in the city projects or on city parks. Uh, and actually, we, we would take any ash tree down that looked at us funny. Uh, any reason it would give us to take it down, we would. So we built our, our plan around um, planning, uh, including communication, implementing, and learning. So the plan, first part of our plan is how big is our problem? As John mentioned, or Dr. Ball mentioned, we've got about 85,000 ash trees in Sioux Falls. In the three different categories, there's more than 22,000 of them are street trees or trees that are between the, the curb and the sidewalk. About 16,000 trees that are in the park system or public areas. This does include uh, trees in natural areas and riparian areas along the river. Um, but however, you know, some of those trees we'll address, some of them we won't. Um, but we do have our bike trail system that goes along the greenway, along the river. We've got other trails within our natural areas. So there's a lot of ash trees in these natural areas that do have targets and will have to be addressed. And then we've got a little more than 4, 000, or 5,000 open grown ash trees within the park system. And then on top of that, we estimate about uh, 45,000 um, private trees that are ash trees. So we've got a pretty significant problem on our hands. About 26% of our total, uh, total population of trees are ash trees. Um, the biggest number that scares us a bit, I mean, you heard Dr. Ball talk about trees falling in the street. Well, 40% of our street trees are ash trees. So as we developed our plan, we developed it with one goal in mind, and that was to keep our ash trees standing for as long as possible versus letting them fall, uh, b falling behind the death curve. I uh, definitely wanted to do what we could to make sure that our, that our response plan was manageable. And when we got to the point where the, the beetle population had exploded, that our resources wouldn't be overwhelmed. So we really got to get out in front of this thing. So we're taking a proactive approach, developed a 10-year plan uh, that we will adjust annually. And we've select, uh, we're going to selectively remove trees. And we started in the core part of the city, but we started kind of in, the, in about 12th Street and South. We wanted to stay away from the, the original infestation, which was found in the northern part of our city. We wanted to stay away from it a little bit. We wanted to make sure that uh, the insects in that area had plenty of food and would move across town slowly. And we also, or as we go, go into this area, we're only gonna remove about a third of the trees. There's a, a, almost 7,000 trees in this removal area and we're marking uh, 2,200 for removal. The idea behind that is, again, we're leaving food behind for the insects so that the infestation as it spreads will spread slowly. It won't find a, a large uh, area where there are no ash trees and then jump. And then once it jumps, of course, we have no idea which way it's going. If we can, if we can keep food around it, hopefully we'll just be able to watch it grow. Of course, we've done selective removals of park trees and public trees. Uh, we removed uh, almost 600 trees last fall out of the park system and off of one of our golf courses. And we, we are restricting the movement of ashwood between Memorial Day and Labor Day. As Dr. Ball mentioned, now is the active period for the adults. And actually, Memorial Day and Labor Day really bookend um, the degree days that really well from where the insect emerges out of the tree and, and then goes back in. We, so... With the quarantine, this is on top of the quarantine. So even though this, with the state quarantine, you can move um, ash wood freely within the quarantine area, in the city of Sioux Falls, you cannot move ash wood between Memorial Day and Labor Day. There are, of course, a few exceptions to the rule. Um, public safety is the biggest thing. We had storm damage here last week. We had some ash trees that, of course, were damaged. Yes, those trees need to be taken care of. We're not going to leave. Um, branches hanging in trees over sidewalks uh, just because we don't want to move ash wood. And the other one is line clearance. Line clearance companies, uh, they still need to clear lines, make sure that they keep their utilities safe. And we're also tracking treatments that are completed by licensed arborists. The arborists in Sioux Falls have to be licensed through the city. And so we've put a requirement on them that when they treat trees, that they will tag the tree and that they will provide us with information as far as the chemical they use, the size of the tree, the location of the tree. And then we put that all into GIS and we map that information. We do that for a couple of reasons. One, once we get these maps developed, we can see 
where the trees are being treated and how many are being treated. And also, as we go through our, with our selective removals, we don't want to force the removal or cut down a tree ourselves that has been treated. If somebody's gone through the expense and the effort to treat a tree, we don't want to cut it down and, until it needs to be. So the next part of our plan is include. Of course, as we developed that plan, we included a lot of people. We got city departments around the table real quick. So the, the announcement was made on the 9th of May that the Emerald Ash Board arrived in Sioux Falls. We swore in a new mayor on the 15th of May. So perfect timing, because we had about a week to put some stuff together to, to get in front of the new mayor. But as I'd mentioned uh, with line clearance, we've got a utility here in town uh, with the city. So Public Works, Light and Power was, has been involved. The street department has been involved. They've got the trucks that can help us haul. Now the landfill, I mean, what are we gonna do with all this wood waste? Uh, they are helping us with that. Um, in engineering, we worked with engineering to make sure that all of the street projects in town that for 2019 that are gonna impact trees, that if they do impact an ash tree, that they're not cutting the tree uh, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, and they're definitely not moving it. If they have to cut it down, we're telling them to store it on site until after Labor Day. And that, just again, is we don't want to be the ones moving the beetle around the town. We want the beetle to do the work. And of course, in um, uh, so GIS, I've mentioned before, the city attorney's office, we developed uh, some new ordinance language that uh, we put into effect, so the not moving the ash wood is one. We implemented a, a street tree planting permit, so now you have to have a permit to plant in the, in the right of way. It's another great way to make sure that we're diversifying the urban forest. Uh, we have taken maples off of our approved street tree list because as we found out quickly, uh, we've got way too many maples. Uh, code enforcement has been involved. They've got uh, um, code enforcement responsibilities in the right of way and on private property as well. Uh, of course, the mayor's office was heavily involved because we went and asked for a lot of money, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, health department's involved. The health department does have a code about storing firewood. So I had to make sure that uh, we didn't allow people to store way too much firewood or store br uh, brush and cause issues for them so that there's, they're at the table. And also, uh, one of the ladies within the health department is our public information officer when we go into our emergency operations center. And she's been a, a great help with us in developing some of our communications and getting the word out. And then of course, um, uh, fire rescue has is, is been with us in this too. Uh, our emergency manager is within uh, fire rescue and has the contract with the 211 helpline center. And they've been great at taking a lot of phone calls and answering a lot of questions and freeing us up to instead of answering the, those phone calls and questions, uh, allowing us to, to manage the infestation in, in our response. State agencies, of course, Dr. Ball's been at the table from the very beginning. Uh, his, uh, having him so close as a resource is, has been very valuable in developing all of our plans. So in July of last year, we went to the city council and we asked for a half a million dollars in capital investment for, inc for equipment and we received it. Uh, we purchased a grapple saw, which essentially is a, um, a crane that on the end of it's got a grapple and a chainsaw, grabs a hold of the branch, cuts it off, and then you can bring the branch down instead of just dropping it. And that thing has been great. We actually received it just after Thanksgiving, so it was an early Christmas. Uh, but making those cuts as those branches reach out um, toward houses or, or over, over other things has been, has been great to have that instead of trying to rope, uh, rope limbs down. We also have another log loader coming. It's not quite here yet, but that'll help us load the, load the debris into trucks. Uh, we, we've got another chipper, and we also got a, another grapple bucket for our front end loader. We also went to the city council and asked for another $1.1 million in our operating budget. Uh, 275,000 of that is in personnel. It's another forestry crew, which brings us up to four forestry crews, and a full-time um, forestry specialist who is helping with the management and the planning of this. And then the, about 825,000 in contractual services. Uh, we, had, we had hoped that we could use all 825,000 for removals and stump removal, um, but we don't have a street tree inventory. 
So we decided that we would remove the stumps with city forces and we would use that money that we had budgeted to get us a street tree inventory so that uh, we know exactly what we're dealing with and have the information moving forward. And so now we've got the plan in place, we've got the people at the table, and now it's time to communicate our plan as we go. And we've done that in various ways. The ordinance changes have been done through press releases. We've sent communication and met with our licensed arborist. We've sent communications to the garden centers, the planting permit. And the success of that planting permit is going to come from the garden centers. They're the ones selling the trees. And if they put the, the, our tree, street tree guide in their hands of their customers as they're buying a tree, if they say, well, I really want a maple, I have to have a maple, it's fine. Plant it in your yard. It's not going in the right of way. And the other things we've done just to communicate our, our response plan, we've done um, press releases, news conferences, we've been to city council informational th uh, three times, we definitely want to keep our elected officials up to speed. We've used social media, we've used utility bill inserts that go out across the city, uh, we've used our e-newsletter, we're leveraging digital marketing that we're going to start here soon, um, community outreach, of course our website, and we've also kicked off a relief project, which is an effort to raise private funds to help us replant trees in Sioux Falls. Because at this point, all we've talked about is removing trees. Well, once we get the trees out, we need to put trees back, uh, make sure that we re reforest our city. So implementing the plan, a street tree inventory that I mentioned a little while ago began on June 3rd. They expect to have the street tree inventory completed by Labor Day, which would be perfect timing for us. Uh, because we're not removing trees and we weren't removing trees when they started so we didn't want them to go out and inventory trees that we come right behind them and cut down uh, we uh, have marked 2125 trees for removal um, they range in size from eight inches to 67 inches in diameter at breast height uh, average is 25 inches it's much larger than what we thought we had actually budgeted for about 18 inches so you can, you can kind of guess what happened to our budget when we just went out for bids and, and came back with, we we're trying to bid out removal of about 54,000 inches. So we sent postcards to the removal area saying, hey, we're going to be in your area, walking up and down the streets, marking trees for removal. Once we marked the, the trees, we marked them with a blue nine, and we sent, the letter, sent letters to those property owners saying, hey, we marked your tree. If you have treated it, or if you plan to treat it, let us know. So you'll notice the 2125 is a little less than the 2200. That's because some of those people called us and said, hey, I'm gonna treat my tree. And so we took it off of our removal list. So I'd mentioned the removal area. Uh, there in yellow is the map of the areas we started. And I've talked about GIS before. The picture next to it, all of the orange dots are trees that are yet to be removed. The green dots are trees that have been removed. The red dots are uh, stumps that have been ground. And then the black dots are trees that have been treated uh, after, after they were marked. So it's just a way that we're making, that we're um, tracking our progress as we go through our response plan. So in 2020, we're moving to the southwest side of town. Again, we're moving a little bit farther away from the, infest uh, the infestation. And we're going to mark about 2,300 trees with, uh, with blue zeros. Uh, we're going with 2,300 instead of 2,200 because as we learned from this year, some people are going to say, hey, I'm going to treat my tree. Please take it off the list. Uh, the inventory that, we're, that is going on right now is going to drive the selection of these trees using size, location, and condition so that we can better pick the trees because the way we did it last time is we just drove down the street and said, well, that one looks good, let's go mark it. Well, that one looks like we should, let's go mark it. And this way we can really, we can do this from the desk and then get out into the field and start removing these trees or marking these trees for removal. Our public remo uh, tree removal plan in 2019, uh, actually it was in it was in the later stages of 2018, we removed trees from 33 different parks in Elmwood Golf Course. We eliminated ash trees from 24 of those parks. Uh, removed 526 trees, which was 140% of what we had planned to remove between 2018 and 2019. 
The reason why we overachieved is we hadn't planned on removing any trees on the golf course. And then we took down about 100 trees on the on El Elmwood Golf Course. Uh, we've taken out 528 stumps, and the plan for 2020 is to remove another uh, 220 plus trees in 19 parks. Some of the parks uh, you, you see listed there, the top eight have more or had more than 90 ash trees in that park when we started. Those trees are going to be on our, or those parks are going to be on our list every year. I can't walk into McKinnon Park and cut down 104 trees. Uh, neighborhood would run me out of the state, I think. Uh, so, uh, and that's again, leaving food behind and also so that we're not creating such, such an aesthetic uh, impact to the neighborhood and to the park. Our planting plan, our planting plan is to plant 500 trees next year within the park system and on public spaces and that we have approximately 375 locations in, in what we've marked for removal where trees could go back in. Uh, the relief project is the private fundraising effort that we're in to help us raise the funds to plant these trees. So for the public trees, for park trees, we're asking for $75,000 out of the relief fund in 2020 to match with $25,000 of city funds to plant 500 trees. And then we would also use relief funds, um, if available, to help private property owners replace trees in a cost share program on the right-of-way. Um, but would not be using any city funds for planting of the right-of-way trees because in Sioux Falls, trees in the right-of-way are the responsibility of the abutting property owner. And so we're already doing them a really big favor by cutting the tree down and grinding the stump at no cost to them. And then learn. What have we learned? What we've learned is that taking a third has worked. We really haven't heard from neighborhoods saying, oh my God, you came in and cut down all the trees in the neighborhood, now it looks terrible. We haven't heard that yet. We've heard that a little bit from some of the parks, uh, neighbors of parks, but we haven't heard it on the streets. So that approach seems to be really good. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to take more trees that are close together. So these two trees here in this picture, we took the one closest to the fire hydrant. Well, in doing so, we didn't allow this property owner any space to plant another tree. What we should have done in hindsight is we should have marked both trees, taken them both, and let this property owner have an opportunity to replant. The other thing we've learned that these large trees are taking us a lot of time to remove. So we're not nearly as far in our removal process as we would like to be um, because we're not removing trees or moving ash wood between Memorial Day and Labor Day either. Uh, but the weather we had this spring really played a role in that as well. But these trees are big and they're ugly and it's just taken a ton of time to get them out. Um, the treatments, we had treatments of approximately 10% of all of the ash trees in Sioux Falls last year, which is great. Uh, really encouraging, and we hope it continues that way to help slow the spread of the infestation. And our planting permit is working. People are they're getting it. They're understanding. Uh, we've got upwards of 40 requests for uh, planting permits already. So again, it's a uh, turn and look at it here. Plan, include, communicate, implement, and learn. And so if you like acronyms, that's because we're in a pickle. Uh, really are in a pickle to make sure that we can do what we can to get all these trees down in our 10-year response plan and make sure that we, we don't end up with a situation in which um, kids walk to school under a canopy of dead ash trees and then uh, walk home around the logs as they've fallen in the street. Okay, thank you, Kelby. So at this time, uh, I would ask for any questions. Um, I think we're going to have to spread the mic around because they're trying to record this, so uh, I hope you don't mind talking to a microphone. We'll just start around here and go around the room because it looks like we have quite a few quest questions. I think my question is for Tom. Do you have a printed list of all the people that can treat ash trees that are licensed in the state? I'm not aware of a list, Darwin. I'd have to uh, do some checking. 
I mean, I know there's a couple places here in Sioux Falls that have treated wood and have cl compliance agreement and stuff like that that have been shipping outside the quarantine area. I thought we had two mics, but I guess we only have one. The reason is, you know, I go to the Black Hill Stock Show. I work the Sioux Empire Farm Show, the Weed and Pest Booth. Dakota Fest and the State Fair coming up, and these questions might be coming up, and it has to be, if I understood it right, it has to be a licensed company that treats these trees. Actually, isn't that a requirement of the, uh, uh, of the city of Sioux Falls? So maybe you can explain that a little bit better. So to do the trunk injections, on trees in Sioux Falls, it has to be done by a licensed arborist. Of course, it's also, they're also a chemical applicator, so they have to be a licensed applicator through the state. But that's, but that's for the treatment of the live trees. That's not for um, treatment of, of the debris once it's down. Because we don't, we don't have any, any regulation on that at all. And one thing, too, is we're only recommending that trees within 15 miles of the infestation be treated. So it doesn't do any good to be treating trees in Pier or in Aberdeen. Um, uh, it's only within 15 miles of the infested trees. So, did that answer your question? Okay, okay, next question. Does the city of Sioux Falls have uh, plans to purchase the injection equipment and to do the injections themselves on the public spaces and the parks that the city would be responsible for? At this time, no, we don't. We, because of the size of problem we have, we're not, uh, we're not treating any trees. We're, ta we're dedicating all of our resources toward removals. Okay, I'm going to ask this as a farmer, and I'm a soybean farmer, and I sell my soybeans all over the world. And part of the reasons we can sell our soybeans in some of the Europe and everything is our sustainability, and that's with the habitat I work on making in my farms. So I've put I, over seven shelter belts, you know, because we're a prairie state. But we also do have a very old shelter belt that's a half mile long, and then I got another shelter belt that my grandpa had. Well, this year we did buy some land and took a shelter belt out. And it was a very, it was a really crappy shelter belt. And we have a payloader. You know what? Some of these shelter belts that we will have to take out are going to be way over $100,000. What are we as farmers going to get for help for this? Because I can't afford it. My banker isn't going to borrow me $100,000 to take care of it and plant trees. So what as a farmer are we going to get and help are we going to get? Great, Sioux Falls has got all this stuff going on, but as I'm a farmer, I'm doing good for the state. I'm bringing habitat in there, and I'm trying to help the every hunting and everything, but, and I've spent a lot of money on these trees and a lot of time, but this is not in my situation that I can control, so I'd like to know what we have as a farmer coming in to help us. Um, well, to begin with, uh, I know that, that NRCS has uh, some programs available for uh, uh, shelter belt renovation. The State Conservation Commission has uh, programs available for shelter belt uh, renovation. Um, strictly tree removal, I don't know that there are any programs out there available for just strictly tree removal, but uh, for renovating windbreaks, uh, there are some funds available. Uh, the conservation districts can apply for those funds uh, to the Conservation Commission and make uh, some grants available. Uh, yeah. Well, the NRCS, the people that are working in there have no tree knowledge. I have done a lot of sh shelter belts. What they tell you to plant, you know, we've gone through this, and I can show you pictures on my phone of shelter belts that we've done huge work on the seedless cottonwood, they tell you to do um, walnuts, and they kill everything. I've learned through, I'm going to get my degree through learning. 
and we need somebody out there that's going to help the farmer that knows because when you buy those trees and you go through the NRCS, they have no knowledge. That person has no knowledge at those places. And we need somebody that's going to help us with these shelter belts. Okay, the, the state does have uh, some uh, people in, in different parts of the state. We've got a, an agroforester in Mitchell. Uh, we have uh, foresters in uh, Sioux Falls and in Watertown. Uh, in fact, now we have two uh, foresters over in, in the Mitchell office. And uh, they can be available to help you out with uh, tree planting questions, help with design of windbreaks, usually the conservation districts. Okay. Um, the, the foresters that we have in, uh, in Sioux Falls and Watertown have been, well, the, the guy in Sioux Falls has about uh, 25 years of experience and uh, knows quite a bit about trees. Um, the, the cons right. But you can, con my recommendation is to call the conservation district, not necessarily the NRCS office. The conservation districts are all pretty much heavily involved in tree planting. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can also provide some assistance through the Department of Agriculture for designing windbreaks. I, I know exactly what you're saying about the black walnut. Uh, it does release a chemical that will kill other plants. So, um, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ball? Well, you hit a major problem. I mean, first of all, Sioux Falls, now keep in mind too, Sioux Falls program is only for their publicly owned trees. If you're in Sioux Falls and have an ash tree in your backyard, it's still on you. And I'm sure Kelby gets the calls. I get the calls now from homeowners saying, I've got a tree, it's gonna cost me $3,000 to take it down. Is the state gonna help me? And we say no, we don't really have state dollars to help private homeowners take down their trees. I recognize you're talking a larger issue but when Kelby's talking about what they're doing, it's strictly the public sector trees that he's working on. You're right, shelter belts are gonna be a big problem. We've got about 2.5 million ash trees and shelter belts. Obviously, any program that's done, my caution is anything you start, make sure you can finish. Because you don't wanna start in one county and say, we got, we got enough money to help people in this county, but oh, we ran out by the time it hit county X. Our biggest issue is going to be, for example, your ash trees. Remove the ash trees, but you already have an existing shelter belt. So then what can be planted back into the ash row that's going to be a substitute for ash, but yet can tolerate the shade and competition for the surrounding trees? So we are working on lists of trees that are adapted to, uh, to being planted into an existing ash row and ways of of allowing those trees to uh, catch up, if you will, and then obviously looking at planting new trees in their place. But again, we're also looking at diversity. And one of those trees we're gonna plant is walnut. It's a darn nice tree. We've got some beautiful belts of it out there. Is it for every belt? No. But the thing you're going to have is no longer we're we going to be saying, go out and plant just this tree. It's gonna be a wide range of trees and we're gonna have to be, let's say, more of a boutique. What fits for your belt may not fit for his belt or that belt. So you're right, a lot more interest has to be spent on planting trees, but you're also right, it's going to be a major cost currently to the existing landowner and it's probably beyond their capability. What we do as a state, I can't speak to, I just deal with the bugs, but I'm just gonna point out that I agree it's going to be a big issue for you. Most of the conversation's been kind of around homeowners' trees. I have a commercial property that's got a few ash on it, I think six total. And so I guess my question, what, and I'm up in the northeast side, so when you say the north side of town, I'm not sure where, you know, that encompasses quite an area. Two, uh, you said that unless I inject them, the root solution is not gonna work, not 100% sure. 
but it's still going to be sold on the shelves like it does work. Well, let, let, me, let me just continue on a little bit. And so I guess my predicament is, one, I didn't want to plant these trees in the beginning, but the city made me. So if they die, and frankly, I really don't care if they do. I mean, I know that I'm not trying to be whatever, but I just soon mow over grass as mow around trees. Speak a little bit to that. I mean, if they do die and I remove them, you made me put them in in the first place, or are you going to come back and say, when you built this, you were, had to have so many uh, trees or evergreens or whatever? Okay, so, yeah, we'll let uh, Dr. Ball answer the question about the treatments. Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the treatments, and then Calvi will go to the management. First of all, there's lots of stuff you can buy in stores that doesn't necessarily work extremely well. All right. Uh, the pour rounds that are available to homeowners off the shelf, they're not going to put enough chemical in there to really be effective on large trees. If you say, John, my tree's only four inches in diameter, it'll work. But if it's four inches in diameter, why would you keep it? Because you're going to be treating it every other year for a long, long time. So for the trees that we're talking about, the 10, 12, 14 inch trees, you can't put enough chemical in it to get enough up in the canopy. So those, is, those are the trees that you have to have a commercial applicator provide the product. And in the city of Sioux Falls, it's by injection, which is our best means of protecting the tree, but without any other environmental consequences. But as to your second question, I'll turn it over to Kelly. So one of the groups of people I think maybe I left off the list that we had up there, um, city departments that contributed, had code enforcement, but it should be planning because planning and zoning has been involved in this as well. So those zoning requirements to have a certain amount of vegetation coverage are still in place. And they're going to stay in place. It's, it's as if, you know, something else came and killed the vegetation that meets your zoning requirement. So... That's going to be something that you're going to have to work through with zoning as far as what is appropriate to put back once those trees do come down. Uh, if, they're on, if they're not within the right-of-way, um, then it's, it's a zoning issue. When they're on the right, in the right-of-way, what I've been told through zoning is that they're not part of that vegetation requirement. So if, it, if they're right-of-way trees, it doesn't matter. But if they're on that, that private property then, it's still going to be something that uh, zoning is going to require for that vegetation coverage. Yeah, yeah usually the vegetation in the right-of-way doesn't count toward your zoning requirement anyway. Other questions? It's, uh, let's say, out by the airport area, all right? Still a fairly large area to it, but if you take a look at that area around the airport, that's generally where the, what we call the core. You're kind of at the edge of it then. Uh, and again, when I say the edge of it, when I call it a core, that means we've got lots of infested trees. There's going to be little pockets around everywhere, but... Let's say you're on the very edge of where we may be finding it. All right, that's what you want to look for. The wood, woodpeckers are far better at finding this than I am. So, so I, again, look for woodpeckers, and that's really our best indicator the tree may be infested. So, John, if I under understood you right you know when we started this thing 10 15 years ago when I was, you know had the program I thought you wasn't real concerned about shelter belts out in the country because they was bad flyers and all this so now so now you're saying every tree looks like ash tree is potentially going to go or are we only referring to in cities Okay, excellent question, and here's the way I look at trees outside of communities. 
South Dakota, particularly eastern South Dakota, has what I refer to as buffet plates and speed bumps. The insect is, and I should phrase this differently, it's an okay flyer, it's just it's a lazy flyer. The reason they're doing what they're doing is if a beetle comes out of a tree, the tree it's most likely to attack is the same one it came out of. And if that tree's too far gone to sustain a lot of attacks, it'll fly to the next closest ash tree. And if that's 50 feet, that's as far as it'll fly. It can fly 15 miles if it has to. And so as Kelby pointed out, what we don't want to do is go up as Michigan did and a number of others says, let's clear cut the northern part of Sioux Falls and suddenly it's all the way down to McKinnon Park and that. But with shelter belts, the issue there is going to be that let's say a community has it and it's infested, but you're 10, 10 miles out of that community. It may be a while before the insect finds your shelter belt. And that's why I pointed out when I said it's going to be throughout a particular area in five years, I'm not saying every tree in those counties is going to be dead. What you're going to find is it's going to move into communities, and then it's going to slowly move out into the surrounding shelter belts. But if it's in one shelter belt and it's pretty much taking care of that one, it can easily fly a mile to the next one. But it will be a slower spread through those communities. What we typically find is river systems it goes pretty quickly. The other problem is once it's in one end of the shelter belt, now we're in the buffet plate because the trees are closely planted together. They're almost acting as one big tree. So once it's in a shelter belt, it's going to move quickly through the shelter belt. But between shelter belts, we have our speed bumps, our cropland. And that'll slow it down. Correct. His question was, well, if it gets in the river system, then it's going to go through the creek system. And you're absolutely right. If you take a look at even at Minnesota, they found it along the Mississippi, of course. That was the first location. And then they found it up in Twin Cities. And they're doing a very good job of managing communities. But they gave up on the Mississippi River. There's no way you're going to be able to deal with that. And we're going to see the same thing, too. It's a very common repairing tree. In fact, if you take a look at ash population in the state, where most of our ash are, are actually in our repairing areas. You know, they're separate from the towns and from the shelter belts. I mean, to me, if you want to look at a future problem, think of all the standing dead ash that fall into the James River. That's going to be an issue as well. So, yep, it, exactly. I mean, I really appreciate the fact you folks are pointing out that this is a bigger issue than just, and, and not to take away from Kelby's concerns, because he's doing an excellent job, and Sioux Falls is a large city, and they're going to have to spend a lot of money managing it. But we also have problems with what are we going to do with all the shelter belts across the state? What are we going to do with all the riparian areas when we start having those trees fall? So. This is going to be a far bigger problem than just communities. Communities is where it strikes first. But eventually, you know, in the next 20 years, we're going to find it impacting a lot of different types of forests in the state. Um, EAB is also a good hitchhiker. It, it can hold on to tree or to vehicles while they're moving at fairly high rates of speed. So another pattern that you can see is uh, emerald ash borer infestations along roadways. Just look at a highway, uh, along highway maps. So, yeah, yeah. Again, firewood is a big mover of uh, of emerald ash borer. Do we have any other questions? I think these guys are going to be around for a few minutes yet, so. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can ask them personally if you don't want to talk into a microphone. <laughs> but thanks for coming. Appreciate it.